College 11. Hey, how you doing? As we press on into the core dates, we go into the uh, second portion of our chapter. Uh, I guess I'd call this chapter 30, section 2, which is on fish. Now, for those of us who are anglers and those of us who are not, this is a great topic. In fact, this is when you look at fish, I often think of the Silurian era. And I'm thinking about 500 plus million years ago, right around that time when some of the most primitive fish came into being, probably things like lancets, and then we looked at the evolution of the jaw. In fact, we look at a couple of classes of our fish, and one class doesn't have jaws at all. It just has a circular suction-shaped mouth. Kind of reminds me of a leech, doesn't it? Well, those are called the anathens, sometimes pronounced agnathens, but lamprey hagfish, we saw them before when we were introducing the chordates, they're pretty primitive, and as we move forward and look at more modern classes of fish, not just class Agnatha, but if we look at our uh, bony fish, Ostyctes, and our cartilaginous fish, Chondrichthys, we get a real good sense of how fish evolved on our planet. And they're still around today, which is another case for the evolutionary argument that even though something has evolved in the past, one thing doesn't turn into another. In fact, when you look at sharks, they're so perfectly adapted to what they do, they're still around. So are hagfish, so are lamprey, so are all these new wonderful varieties of fish in the oceans. So let's get right to it, because we've got a lot to do. All right, so reflection is on. Nice. And there we go. So, chapter 30, section 2, the fish. So it's fairly important to know really what a fish is, whether or not we're talking about a jawless fish, like the class Agnatha, which we might as well throw in here. Tell you what, let's scroll in, and let's say what the major classes are, okay? Just so we get it out in the open. We've got one, oops, ah, Class Anatha, or Agnatha, I don't care which way you say it. It's fighting me now. I'm going to go to... There we go. Okay, so that would be like our lampreys or our hagfish. Two. Quite, quite a word to fit in here, but I'll do it. There we go. And then third. Now remember, chondro, you should be thinking of, you probably see a supplement if you go into just about any health food store called chondritin. It basically has a lot to do with, it. the stem of the word really means um, having to do with cartilage. So the second one of the cartilaginous fish. And the last one, because you know about bone, I'll stike these, should help clue you in. As soon as you see that, you should understand which fish you're talking about. These are the three major classes. Now they're all vertebrates. They have uh, bony endoskeletons. And when we look at what it takes to be a fish, we really should orient ourselves to basic characteristics and to the fins. This comes up an awful lot. Okay, so what do we got? We've got paired fins, Scales and gills. All right, no big deal. What we have, let's look at our propulsion system, the caudal fin here. Now, in this case, when you look at more recent, much more recently evolved fish, they have this nice, what we call homocircle tail, where the top and the bottom are very similar in appearance. However, if you look at sturgeon, sharks, things that are a little older, we'll just go back a little bit. There we go. I'll get rid of this animation. In older fish, what you will see is you'll see what's called a heterocircle tail, where the top is bigger than the bottom. And that indicates relative age. Sturgeon, sharks, you get the idea. So let's undo that so that's gone. 
Our dorsal fin, made famous by the movie Jaws, no doubt, is this, well, let's just say it, fin along the dorsal surface. For my, there we go, right here. Okay, so that's our dorsal fin. Anal fin, self-explanatory, closest to the anus itself, which is probably right about there. If you look at the anus, you come up a little bit higher on a fish. On us, it wouldn't be this high, but on a fish, the fins a little bit more anterior are called the pelvics. The pectoral fins, you'll notice your goldfish you use these for fine movements in the tank. And they're just sort of like steering fins. They, they don't have a more significant job than that. Let's switch up colors because this is a little bit. Let's go with this. The fins, when you think about their roles, if this is propulsion, the dorsal fin and the anal fin kind of like keels in a way. They keep you going steadily through the water and they keep you upright. When a fish is going at top speed, it's not going to rely on its pelvic fins and pectoral fins. Those are largely for lateral movements. Your dorsal and anal fin, you think of them as almost like rudders in the water on the top and the bottom of the surface of the fish. You've also got an interesting structure here. If you were to ask how to fish here, well, you'd have to zoom in on something called the lateral line. If you look really close on any fish, you'll see it. And it feels the effects of sound waves. So they can feel vibrations in the water and it's a little pitted surface. If you ever look really close at them, you'll see little dots. Those are like little water intake spots. And the fish will feel vibrations in the water in a basically a tactile way. They don't have uh, an ear like we would have, or uh, really even amphibians. It's not until you really get to the frog that you'll see the equivalence of an eardrum. And in a frog, it's on the outside. I'm getting a little ahead of myself. But in a fish, it's kind of interior, but the water's got to go into these little pits first. Okay, I think the rest is relatively self-explanatory, except for the operculum, which is the gill cover right there. And, and when we do labs, I largely excise or cut that out so you can see what's going on. So there you go, an introduction to fish. So as we said about 500 million years ago, when you look at the earliest fish, we're looking at things like what they call ostracoderms and placoderms, and they are they were covered in, in bony plates, and even their jaws weren't in place. They, they, had, they were kind of like jawless. So let's pop out for a second and look at an ostracoderm. There we go, ostracoderm fish, and we'll get a visual on this. There we go. Uh, here we go. And this is what we find in the fossil record. Evidence of these really interesting jawless fishes where they were just going along the bottom and finding, if you think about skates and rays, they have a similar function where they cruise along the bottom and search for mollusks and things like that to eat. Interesting segmentation. There's a great shot of one lots of bony plates and these bony plates started to merge over time in the, the sort of the evolution of the fish or the fish is whichever you, way you'd like to say it but they were very ancient and they left behind lots of hard parts for us to find imagine swimming along and seeing that coming through the water now this this particular individual is where we start to see the evolution of a jaw it begins to form because jaws are amazing things they allow you to grasp you can hold on to prey. It's better for your survival because as you feed, you have a greater chance of breeding. So, now that we know about those crazy looking primitive fish with their bony plates and the fact that they were like these crazy bone like extensions on their bodies, we know that fish precede amphibians. And how do we know that? Because we can't find fossilized amphibious skeletons 500 million years ago. Life began in the ocean, largely, and the fish are the vertebrates that really went to town. That was their domain. So here we go, uh, talking about 
the usefulness of JAWS. I've more or less already mentioned this. Uh, there's also the defensive aspect. I didn't get into that, but your JAWS give you a wide variety of food to, to be able to consume. If you look at, for example, the great white shark, and it can open its jaw past, uh, it's approximately 200 degrees, where it's death from below, when they try to come up from underneath and do that tremendous bite, they can not only open their upper jaw, but they can open their lower jaw in concert. So they can essentially just peel their head back with this tremendous, um, well, you'd have to call it a two angle because that's what it is, when they attack their prey. That gives them a lot of options with the prey that they're going to consume. I think it goes without saying that the cartilaginous fish and the bony fish were going to be the two more or less major groups. And the cartilaginous fish that we all know and love, we've got our skates, which are very similar to our rays. The skates don't tend to have the spines in the tail. Uh, a stingray is called a stingray because of the, the, we'll get into this in a minute, the little bony um, spines that they have in their tail. And if it's also, also venomous, so if they nail you, let's just say it, it can be fatal. And that's what happened with the crocodile hunter. Skates have little sort of bony protrusions. And whoop, there we go. And they, they're a little bit different than rays. They actually have little teeth where rays have more like large sort of grinding plates. Very similar animals, but really small differences. But fish made of true bone, um, we can talk about rainbow trout. Oops. We can talk about perch, walleye, the list goes on and on. If you're a fisher person, you probably catch the bony fish. Now, again, this goes back to the difference between class chondrichthys, cartilaginous, and osteichthys, the bony. Okay, let's get into the body systems a little bit. Essentially, what they're going over here is sort of like a respiratory system overview. So we'll just label it for what it is. Now, zooming in on the gills here, that's a fairly interesting organ itself. Fish could live out of water if the gill tissue were kept wet and exposed to air. Now, water has the highest oxygen content. You know, think around four degrees. Water's gotta be fairly cool. Fish have to do a lot of work to extract oxygen from their aqueous environment, their liquid environment. Now, some fish, in fact, are air breathers. And if you look at alligator gar, for example, they can swallow air and take it down into a, a modified swim bladder and exchange it with blood vessels. But when you think of most fish, what we look at are the, uh, the gills, which you're sort of seeing, well, not sort of seeing, you're seeing in this region here. Highly vascularized and pumping in one direction. So let's pop out of this for a second. Got some things to show you. Let's put the iPad down for a moment. There we go. And I got a couple of goodies ready to go. Um, if we look at, here we go. Uh, this is a neat animation. A fish has a pair of gills covered by a bone. Now I'm going to mute that. Um, I'll do the narration here. There's fine little bony plates that hold the gill tissue apart. In some fish, it's quite substantial. When the fish uh, effectively respirates, it lowers its mouth and pushes its tongue up against the roof of its mouth and pushes water in, let's just pause this for a second. It pushes it across the gills. Now, it's an interesting thing called a counter current exchange. It means that the flow of blood, the tired blood is always coming in the direction uh, that's uh, most advantageous to renew. So as the water is passing over the gill, this is where the tired what blood would be uh, interacting with the water and oxygen will diffuse across. Let's put that in a more simple way. Tired blood comes down and is renewed by the water flowing cross current across the gills. So this is, this is a very smart design. Um, in our lung tissue, it's, it's quite similar. It's just that the blood is flowing uh, opposite to the direction of the water. Continue with the animation. These are called lamellae. So you can see that the tired blood 
enters the capillaries here, and the fresh blood continues on in this direction. Give it a second to catch up. It's, it's all about diffusion. And you can see how those are flowing in opposite directions. And here is the large surface area of the gill lamellae. And what it's doing is the blood vessels are picking up what they can, pretty well anything they can, uh, as far as dissolved oxygen in the water. Now, when you look at fish that, that are air breathers, we got to remember the fish that are air breathers, they'll be in, in, in filthy water, high bacteria content, swampy water. Catfish are like that. And they can't rely upon gill tissue here, these lamellae, these folds, to do the job for them. In fact, they are air gulpers because their gills would never, ever get enough oxygen out of water. So we'll dismiss that for a second. Some fish are pretty interesting. Some fish will have a reverse scuba system and they'll move up on land. And this little critter here called the mud skipper is a lot of evidence for that. It stores water in its gill pouches, like a reverse scuba system, and it respires, uh, it passes that water over its gills, and this little guy called the mud skipper is pretty neat because it skips up on the mud and tries to get noticed, and the males have these neat little mouth battles. These guys uh, will often come up on land, and they'll use their fins to drag themselves, and they can climb uh, mangrove roots. Um, here's a really good shot of it where it can move along on land. Fancy little sail fin there. Ah, there we go. Its, it's eyes are well protected. And it comes up on land and it will literally, it'll create little underground sort of egg laying chambers that are very aqueous, uh, very watery environment. And it's important for them to do that because they get a lot of their food up on land, even though this is a fish. You can see how it's using its fins here. It gives you a hint as to their relationship with the amphibians. And they skip when they jump up in the air to get noticed, attract females, bizarre looking little critters, climbing along. And it makes you think about the amphibians. You know, sort of, there must have been a version of a fish that decided to come up on land and, you know, was going in between water and land. And, yeah. There's other fish that can live up on land. This one's gotten a lot of notoriety lately, I think partly because of watching um, uh, fishing shows on television, things like that. Um, this one's called the snakehead fish, and it's an invasive species. Interestingly enough, this one can stay up on land and can come after your critters, <laughs> your cat and your small dog. Um, it's capable of doing this because it's got what's called a superbranchial organ and that's here and that's a little lung-like organ here that's fixed behind the gills and it's a primitive lung it allows it to resp respire with its external environment and as long as this fish stays wet it can survive out of water pretty interesting there are also fish that can do what that can do what reptiles do and form a cocoon uh, called an estivation chamber lungfish Let's see if I can find that for you and they'll just wait out dry times by forming a fluid filled sac and living in it until it's time to break out let's see if we can find it oh here you go roughly like this uh, maybe that's not the one I wanted Let's see. Ah, well, this diagrams it pretty well. Burrows underground. Let's look at the original image here. And just like some toads will, this is a lungfish. It'll form a slimy cocoon around itself. And it will just wait until it's high time, or rainy season again, to come up to breed, feed, survive. You get the idea. So that shows that fish aren't all about hanging out in the water. In fact, some are quite happy to hang out on land. Here's our friend Ostyctes, all our wonderful bony fish. And I had a nice little example of Chondrichthys here with our 
sharks and our skates and our rays. Dogfish are in this group. So cartilaginous skeleton. They do have vertebrae. It's just it's composed of it's composed of something other than calcium carbonate. Um, these ones are just have a cartilaginous skeleton. So class can direct these. There you go, more or less. So we'll put these away. Nice. Okay, we'll go back to our lesson. We'll finish off our examples. But I do want you to take a peruse of. I'll just pop back in here. Um, I don't show all these because it, it just make a super large video. There's an animation here that d looks at fish respiration. Uh, virtual salmon dissection, that's always fun. Break out a spoon and carve out the organs. Um, you can ignore this one. Vertebrate evolution, where we look at uh, some of our earliest critters, like our fish, and then we get into our amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. And our friend, the coelacanth. I highly advise you look at the coelacanth, because it, well, it's like our mud skipper. When you look at fish that are going to move on land, the coelacanth has the makings of what appear to be really strong wrist bones. The coelacanth, here's a nice picture of one. We thought it was extinct until we found juveniles you know, off things like the coast of Africa. When you look at its fins, its fins are quite substantial, but they're extremely fleshy. And in there are bones that you would find uh, sort of like in, the, in your own wrist. And they're extremely strong and well-made. And when you look at something like the mud skipper, you wonder, what, what is it that came out of water that had enough uh, in its limbs to be able to effectively kind of move around on land? The coelacanth is like that. And we used to find these um, washed up on land. Uh, and for the longest time, I remember when I was, a, when I was a, a kid, even into the 80s, they talked about the coelacanth and the fact that fishermen were bringing them up in their nets. But it's pretty neat the fact that they found living ones. It's a very large species. And here's a good shot of its fins. Because when we look at what we think first climbed out of the water, something was a little bit more amphibian, you can see that the coelacanth has the makings of wrist bones and what start to look like digits in its fins. And this is, when a coelacanth is viewed underwater, you can see this over here, they, they'll perch on the bottom, they'll perch on rocks. So something like a coelacanth would have been that beneficial mutant that came up onto land to perhaps do more than jump out of the water than attack prey, but to wiggle up on land and go after food. In fact, if you think of a lot of the arthropods were up on land, so there was a food source just waiting up on land and then thumbing its nose at things which were starting to have the ability to come out of water after them. And there you go. That's the coelacanth. And there's a great video of it right here. Take a trip to YouTube, type in coelacanth, you'll see all sorts of stuff. I extremely recommend that you go check out this class agnathan. And here it says fish without jaws, class agnatha. And look at the defensive mechanism of hagfish. This is great. When you look at their the, the protein slime that produ they produce from their glands, that is always worth seeing. I always show that off live in class, but I'll give you the opportunity to go on YouTube and check it out. Okay, so back to our notes. Let's make sure we get that out of the way. There we go. Okay, so we were all zoomed in on the gills the last time. I think we can motor through this a little more quickly. In a fish, it's really a two-chambered heart. The blood itself is going to come back from the body. Here, tired blood. There we go. Pass into the heart, and then be pumped around to the gill lamellae. So a lot of people look at this and say, no, no, it's a three-chambered heart. No, 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 it's not. Not really. It's got... It's got an atria and a ventricle, which is pretty simple, but just like in us, it's got a sinus venosus and a sinus arteriosus. Think of it this way, a loading and exiting zone for blood coming into and out of the heart proper. But the heart is in the center there. Okay, so without getting too technical, you need to focus in on, what, on the heart, not the sinus venosus and the uh, bulbous arteriosus, okay? We don't want to do that. 
it's a pretty simple system. Travels around the body, and the nutritive blood becomes tired, comes back to the heart for a recharge, and gets passed around to the gills. There's also a buoyancy organ in fish, swim bladder right here, which in some fish becomes a primitive lung, a similar structure is used for their uh, for gas exchange, and it, it, it does exactly what it says it is. It adjusts the buoyancy, so you get, if you have to think of it as a balloon, I don't like that term, but if you think of pumping gas into it or moving gas from it, they can adjust their uh, natural flotation in the water, depending on what they need to do. And when I was at Banfield Marine Station as a, a UVic student, we went out and we pulled up fish from uh, the ocean to take a look at. And when we brought them up, as you bring them up really quickly, uh, their swim bladders under less pressure will suddenly inflate. And one of the grad students, it was their job, let's switch colors here now, it was their job to puncture the swim bladder with a fine needle so that it could deflate a little bit so the fish could actually swim back down because if that wasn't done the seagulls just went to town on these poor fish and ate them all day long. Okay, so we didn't want that, we just wanted to look in on the fish, not kill them, right? The jawless fishes, those are Iagnathans, Chondrichthys here, oh, there we go, and our bony fish, Ostichthys. So there's three major groups that you need to know. It's not good enough to just say that they're jawless, cartilaginous, and bony. Class Agnatha, Chondrichthys, and Ostichthys. Okay, know the names. That's what we all had to go through. Our jawless fish, I'll throw this in here, Our a, oops, doesn't seem to want to behave today. Let's get back to this. There you go, or Agnathans, and it comes from the term without a jaw. Nice descriptive terms, like Latin sometimes. When you look at our Agnathans, um, when we look at our things like our lamprey, and our hagfish, all they have, they're, they're like these cartilaginous, wiry fishes, and really they just have an overcord. See if I can get that to do that again. Ha, ah, go to this. They're just the notochord fish. And in fact, when these are prepared, I was watching um, River Monsters with Jeremy Wade, and he was looking at northeastern um, harvesting of lamprey, and they would pull the notochord right out of them um, and roast them on sticks. And they're supposed to have a, an oily consistency, very similar to mackerel. And they've been around a long time. And there they are. There's a lamprey, and what I wanted to draw on here was this raspy tongue, this thing right here. They basically lick until you bleed, and then they just consume it. Um, that's different. Hagfish aren't like this. Hagfish um, will grab and tear off flesh to consume it. Very different than the function of a lamprey. Let's see here. Just a second. Seems to be coming up blank, and I don't think so. So, back to Dropbox here. Not sure. Seems kind of strange. Huh. Isn't that odd? I'll just open another instance. It's like I didn't get the whole file. Okay. Let's go down to our page here. There we go. Okay, so there's our hagfish, and hagfish have these little barbs here for grabbing, which are just fleshy extensions, and they'll just grab onto a piece of flesh. They can make a knot in their bodies and work that knot right down to where they're pulling on flesh. Maybe it's a dead baby seal on the bottom of the ocean, and tear away strips. Their eyes are primitive. These are more or less just light sensors, because these kind of fish will consume on the dead corpses of animals that die off the coast, and that's a fairly dark place. 
they find any food, they consume it. And they've got these little slime glands, which secrete a, it's like a powdered protein that becomes a power gelatin. And that power gelatin can smother anything that tries to consume these guys. Imagine if you got gelatin all over your gills and you suddenly couldn't breathe. Not too much misses, messes with hagfish. They're pretty gross. There's our sharks and their relatives. So this is chondrichthys. So I'm going to get back to my writing tool. It's quite a, quite a name to spell. Chondrich. T H Y E S. Easier to do handwriting sometimes. So lots of variation here. Um, it, it's interesting when you look at the skates and the rays, for example. The rays are just, think of them as having that stinging thing in the, in the uh, in their tail. Another major difference between skates and rays is rays will bear their live internally. So they'll give, their eggs will hatch inside their body and their babies will come out. That doesn't happen with skates. They release eggs. They're a little, little bit more sort of, tr sort of a traditional, older school kind of reproductive mentality there. So it's hard to tell from a distance, but it's really neat when they launch out of the water like this. I think this is a Pacific skate, if I'm not mistaken. There we go. At least they finally said it. Class, I'll stake these. Yay. Boom. Skeletons made a bone. And a lot of these stike these, a lot of these fish have these soft rays in their fins. They're just little slender bony spines. They're not something that you would really feel. But let me give you a warning. With a lot of ocean fish, you have to be aware that they'll have spines and a really, it'll be a, a substantial spine, especially in, in the anus, um, up on the dorsal fin. Perch are like this. When you go to grab perch, you have to be aware of the spines. And there's, as far as their, as far as the ray fins go, they've got flesh, which they just more or less put over top of those spines and it helps them to swim. Smart. Here we have a catfish right here. Big old catfish, air breather, right? Something like a walleye here, ocean sunfish here, and a red-bellied piranha right there. Look at the chompers on that guy. I, was, I love this picture. It's always got the impression, how you doing? Yeah, at the beginning of the year, one of the things that we always key out are various types of fish, and I, I love this picture of the ocean sunfish. Uh, I don't think the diver is actually that close. It's just the perspective of the picture. If you want to have a little bit of fun on YouTube with our friend the catfish here, look up a form of fishing called noodling and um, where people put their hands down in the catfish reds and the catfish bites the hand. They don't, they kind of have a, catfish don't really have really bony teeth. They're just like pads and these sometimes called redneck fishing they'll pull these catfish up out of the water and it's kind of like the fight is on. Just try not to drown while you're trying to pull out a 20 pound, 30 pound catfish. And the rest of this is all about uh, quiz material. You can take a view of that yourself. I won't do that here. But anyways, um, this is an introduction to fish and there's a lot more we could go over here. Uh, there's many varieties of fish we haven't described, but in general, a fish is a, it's in subphylum vertebrata, in phylum chordata, and it's in kingdom animalia. We looked at three major classes. We looked at class agnatha, the ones without jaws or circular jaws, hagfish and lamprey. We looked at class ostyctes, the bony fish, which you're seeing here. And we looked at class chondrichthys, which are the sharks, the skates, the rays, and things like that. Okay, I hope you enjoyed. I'm done, and I think... It's time to go get some exercise. So, ladies and gentlemen, have a good one. And I am out.